just want to give an introduction to Veronica. She comes to us today from the University of Arizona, uh, Lunar and Planetary Lab. Is that, yeah, that's right. Um, her, her background is she did her undergraduate at University College London. Uh, she was from London originally, and then did her PhD at an Imperial College, uh, also in London. Um, before she came to the United States uh, to go to the University of Arizona, she both worked um, on the High Rise mission, um, as well as worked on um, impact modeling with Jay Melosh um, back in the day, and uh, has remained at the University of Arizona ever since um, as a research scientist. Um, and today she's going to talk to us today about the Kuiper Belt objects um, uh, and the DeFord lecture, but because she's the Barnes lecture, we get to have two uh, talks from her, and so she will talk again tomorrow at the Water, Climate, and Environment seminar at noon, and that one will be on Chicxulub as well as the Nadir impact craters. Okay. All right, Thanks with no further so ado. And just one thing I forgot. Oh, yeah, lights. Great. <laughs> okay, so Sh Sean covered some of this. Um, I have two parts to my job. Um, uh, half of it is commanding the high-rise camera to take images of Mars. Um, I always like to add a quick plug-in that it's not just the science team that make, gives us suggestions, it's also the public. So we have a, a, a website called High Wish where you can, everyone can give us our suggestions, uh, which I then plan and take images of. Uh, my involvement with High Rise also makes me um, familiar with mission operations. So while I'm showing you Pluto and New Horizons data today, um, some of the comments that I'll be making are mission operations considerations, like how we chose our images, um, whether they did or did not come back in good time or not. The other part of my job is my science, my research position. Um, I've been fortunate enough to to work on a few missions now, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, Cassini and New Horizons. So I do flit about the solar system and so I've got my eye in now for enough bodies that I'm useful to teams as a comparative planetologist. So when we've been looking at Pluto images, like I'll, I'll remember something I've seen on Mars and can add that into team discussions. And my, uh, my speciality is impact cratering. And so the, the two talks that I have for you t today and tomorrow, they're completely different. Today is a t basically a visual tour of the Pluto system and the Kuiper Belt object Arakoth, um, but with a bit of an impact cratering spin because I'll be able to give you the most, most information about the impact processes that we see. Um, and one of the take-homes from this talk is how impacts given the right conditions, are not, they're not destructive. They can be constructive, it's how the, how the planet's formed via accretion. But tomorrow, not saying that this isn't a fun talk today, but tomorrow is the destructive side of impacts. Um, I'm going to show you what would happen if a different size of asteroid plowed into Dallas, for example, what we would see here in Austin. So, in terms of... Uh, how impacts are not just destructive. They are, uh, firstly, the planets were created via accretion, the constructive side of impacts. And then once, we, once we'd formed our planets, we then have even more useful things happening like the further delivery of uh, water and other volatiles from comets and asteroids. Um, but impacts also then go on to shape what we see. So not just the scars of impact, the impact craters themselves, but a large enough impact is going to change your entire system. And so on this page I have just a couple of examples um, of potential things that happen due to impact. Um, Uranus is famously tipped over on its side. Um, a massive impact early on in its history could have done that. Uh, Venus um, spins in the opposite direction to the other planets. Um, a, a big enough glancing blow from an impact could have been the reason for that. Um, I don't know whether they are the accepted reasons, but with impact cratering as my speciality, I can pretty much make anything that we see in the solar system 
about impacts. And on, on the plane here, anything circular on the ground is like a potential impact crater for me. <laughs> oh, um, and lastly, I have the, the image of the moon, which we think formed as a result of a giant impact. Um, but the influence of that impact didn't just stop there. The fact that we have a moon stabilizes the Earth's axis and it prevents large, shift, large shifts in our axial obliquity, um, which gives us stable seasons. So it makes life much easier on Earth. And so I wanted to mention that ahead of us getting to Pluto. So this diagram here shows Earth at the top with our modest axial tilt and then Pluto with a much larger axial tilt. Um, so we have, like I said, it's uh, relatively mild seasons um, because we have a small amount of our globe that is the Arctic and the Antarctic zones those which get constant sunlight at winter or uh, um, constant darkness, um, they're relatively small for us. Whereas Pluto has these very large equatorial zones, sorry, not equatorial, um, Antarctic and um, Arctic zones, which leads to massive temperature variations during its seasons. You know, hundreds of years of darkness or 124 years of darkness for one pole and then it's in light for another section of the year and this extreme fluctuation in temperature combined with the fact that Pluto has an elliptical orbit which takes it um, as close as 30 astronomical units to the Sun out to 50 astronomical units which is um, the distance from the Earth to the Sun is one astronomical unit. This creates uh, very extreme seasons. So if we take that, um, those extremes and then also consider that the surface temperature of Pluto is very close to the condensation point of several volatile ices, um, methane, nitrogen, carbon monoxide, we get clear volatile cycling from pole to pole over the course of um, Pluto's year. So to orientate you to the, the images that you're about to see, um, the, the North Pole will be visible uh, in, in all of the images and I wanted to mark on the equator before we move on. So the the images of Pluto that I'm going to be showing you today are mostly going to be um, enhanced color here because it allows us to combine the true color of Pluto where we have that high resolution imagery that gives us the, the surface uh, features that we can see and it's been merged with our compositional data to assist with the um, with us being able to see what the compositional variations are over the surface. And it creates this in enhanced color image. Okay, so first we're going to take a zoom in at the, the North Pole. So we arrived during northern summer. So at the moment, the, the atmosphere is not condensed on the surface. It's currently in as an atmosphere. And so we can see some of the ices um, and some of the older, um, older features that we wouldn't have been able to see had we visited Pluto in its winter when it, all of this would have been covered with um, fresh snow deposit. So uh, the three things that I was hoping to point out on this slide, um, the first, canyon systems slightly difficult to see. Th this one's a good example. We have north-south trending fracture systems uh, that go, that we, s that we see in this ancient uh, terrain of the, the northern polar deposits. Uh, we see an awful lot of craters, which is how we know that this is old terrain. They are mostly very degraded craters, however. Um, we also see dendritic valleys. 
so not uh, surface water flow related, but what we interpret to be glacial valleys, so that during the winter of each Pluto year for the northern hemisphere, you'll get the deposition of uh, nitrogen ice and some more methane ice, and that the glaciers flow and carve the underlying ices. Um, of course, we also see sublimation deposits. Um, well, sorry, not deposits in this case, sublimation features. Um, and I think I've tried to make these more... This is not enhanced color. This is completely false color image. It's just stretched so that we can better see some of the, um, the canyon systems and the, the dendritic networks are particularly uh, visible in this kind of extra stretched image. Oh, and just a promise to those of you interested in fracturing, I will get back to the importance of these large, very ancient fractures just a bit later. Um, so zooming in at a another section of Pluto so that we can see some of this sublimation related scarp retreat. We were just up here and here as the north, and north polar um, sublimation features. So as we come back to towards the equator, which runs about here, um, we get less and less volatile cycling because we get less extreme seasons at this part of the, um, the body. But this is a, another good example of some scarp retreat. Um, it's going to be coming into here in uh, Periplanitia. Um, so this is the, the, the visual image uh, with place names here. And then some of the Ralph and Lisa data from New Horizons um, showing the compositional variation. Uh, we didn't get the compositional data back until much later than the images. Um, and so we, we didn't know whether we did see water ice on Pluto for a while. We could infer it because of um, some, of the, some of the heights of the mountains that we saw. Um, but until we got this compositional data back, we couldn't be sure that we were seeing water ice bedrock, um, which is what it was predicted to have. Uh, but now we do see a, a water ice bedrock exposed underneath this um, methane ice. One of the things that I find interesting or weird about this um, is that the, the older terrain, so the, the water ice bedrock that then gets covered with um, methane ice, it's technically older but it hasn't been exposed at the surface for as long as the methane ice. And so if any impacts occurred in this area before this scarp retreat had happened, they would have formed in the methane ice um, and then got removed um, as the scarp retreat occurred. So, um, if we move towards the equator, it gets a little bit of sunlight every day on Pluto, all throughout the year, and so it's still very cold, um, but you, you're not getting that volatile cycling that occurs in the more Arctic and Antarctic zones. And so as a result, we get the deposition of tholins in an equatorial band that runs around all of Pluto, apart from where its heart gets in the way. So um, the creation of tholins occurs as a result of the atmospheric um, like methane gases being broken down by UV, and then the particulates basically fall down onto the surface or are broken up in situ from the methane ice on the surface to create what I've heard referred to as brown space gunk, which is the, the tholins. But this is an atmospheric phenomenon. It's just based on UV breaking down these, these compounds. So it occurs globally. But the reason we get this equatorial uh, chain is that it's messed up everywhere else. 
the volatile cycling disrupts that solin deposition planet-wide, apart from at the equator, where we don't have such a yearly um, sublimation and then deposition of other ices. And so this leads to a, a really dark deposit at the equator. It's not really as red as it's, it is here in this um, false color image. And apologies, this isn't showing up on the screen very well at all. Um, another thing that we see in the equatorial regions is some of the highest crater density that we see on Pluto at all. So impact craters are, we can work out how long a planetary surface has been exposed to, to space based on how many impact craters are there. So it's similar to the number of bugs on your windshield during a, a long journey. The longer you've been on that journey, the more bugs are on your windshield. And then if you turn your windscreen wipers on, which would be geologic activity, you wipe those bugs away. So when geologic activity occurs on a planetary body, it wipes off that record of impact craters. And at the, um, at the equator, like I said, we don't have that volatile cycling and so we have very old terrain building up. So moving on to the, the famous part of Pluto, um, which strangely, it's not a, a living entity, but I felt like after its demotion and all of the, the, the outcry from the public of Pluto not being a planet anymore, we arrive and it's got a heart on it. I just thought it was, <laughs> yes. Um, gaining favoritism, but we're, we're about to move on to Sputnik Planitia, which is this area, and then the heart itself is referred to as Tombar Regio. And the heart is the reason we imaged this side of Pluto. So as a flyby, we were only ever going to image one side of the planetary body, and um, we had to choose which side that would be. And so we went back to Hubble images and the, the other side didn't have such a stark contrast between a bright area and a dark area. And when you have that extreme albedo contrast, it's suggestive of some geologic activity. And we, we didn't know whether that would just be a case of a relatively fresh impact crater or something had thrown up some fresher ice or something else. And so, it's, it is impact related, as I said, most things are. Um, but of course, the, the bright active terrain was nothing like we had imagined. The, um, the New Horizons team did seem very, very split on what we were going to expect when we got to Pluto. Um, some people were expecting activity based on that Hubble image and um, others of us, and I, I, was, I was one of these people, just expecting to turn up seeing a cratered, not a boring body, because I love a load of impact craters, but a relatively geologically dead body. And so finding this churning mass of nitrogen ice was a bit of a surprise. Now, Sputnik Planitia is a deposit of nitrogen and carbon monoxide ice um, that settled into a huge impact basin which is best seen up at the top of the screen here. There's a digital elevation model um, which shows you that this is a, a, a deep impact scar, um, which then had cold trapping of this uh, volatile ice and the beginnings of convection. So uh, just pointing out that um, we do see some uh, compositional variance in this and that is the, the outer sections of the deposit seem to have uh, a lack of carbon monoxide and we do see carbon monoxide in, in the center. And this, this image really does show you the general trend um, color-wise. You've got red tholins, you've got blue methane, and then your nitrogen and carbon monoxide mix. Uh, immediately, I did say generally, immediately I can 
say that there are exceptions to this. Up in the North Pole, we saw both yellowish and bluish areas in this false color image, but those were both different ages of methane ice. So once the methane ice has been exposed at the surface for long enough, it does start to get, um, it does show up yellow in the compositional data just because of space weathering. So having a zoom in, um, <clears throat> so um, at this point, one of the other team members made the joke that there were no impact craters and I could go home. The, this was one of the first high resolution images that we were expecting home. Uh, and we'd seen the, as we approached Pluto, we'd get a new set of images every day. Um, a lot of us were expecting a just a plain boring ice sheet and so after the fanfare of um, getting that the, the globe view of Pluto which was our fail safe image the image that would be our last if we didn't make it through the Pluto system without hitting a moon or something else made the um, made the mission fail that would have been our last last image and we knew that this area just a moment sorry We knew that this area was going to be one of our, uh, our first images. So some of us came into work ready the next day for just a barren ice sheet. Um, we were not expecting convection cells. Um, there are 199 of these convection cells. Trust me, we really looked for that extra one, but we, uh, ev everyone confirmed it's 199. Um, most of them um, bow up in their center, and then the troughs are lower topography. Um, so that's one of the indications that these are convecting, is that we see that upwelling at the center, and then this uh, kind of subduction at the edges. You'll notice that there's also pitting, and that the pitting occurs closer to the edges, generally speaking, and that it's absent in the, the center of these convection cells. That's because we think these pits are sublimation cups. And so those take time to form. You need enough, um, enough ice to sublimate away to form these pits. And that your fresh ice is upwelling at the center. So it's young, it's warm, it's not, it's not forming these sublimation cups. And as it moves away from the center, pushed pushed away by more recent upwelling. It's then been at the surface longer and allows it to form these sublimation pits. Okay, here's a, a zoom in to show you some more of the sublimation pits. Um, some of them even reach down to beneath the uh, nitrogen ice deposit. And we think that they're forming uh, along weaknesses in the ice or some sort of compositional difference in the ice because they do sometimes form these kind of fingerprint texture patterns. Um, other small scale features that we see on, on this nitrogen ice uh, surface is we see, um, I keep wanting to say sand dunes, but they're, um, we think that it's fragments of uh, methane ice blown off the surrounding mountains that basically give you that sand, sandy material and there's enough of an atmosphere on Pluto to give you a predominant wind direction which you can follow with these dark streaks. We think that those are the wind streaks um, and that results in your, your transverse dunes. Having a look in at, um, at the, uh, the, the mountains, at the edges of this large impact basin. So I wouldn't refer to these strictly as mountains in a geologic sense. They are mountains because they are very large features, they're high topography at their peaks, 
but what these are is collapse blocks. You've got your large um, impact basin has formed, and then the, the rim of the impact basin has started to collapse down, and these large blocks of ice have then tilted, exposing fresh ice, sometimes with some layering. Um, and we think that the layering that we see in there is a um, yearly and even longer scale deposition of the tholins in the area and then deposition of other ice. So you get the buildup of layers. And there's also um, signs that the deposit here, the nitrogen ice deposit of Sputnik clinicia, is sometimes higher because um, you have this little captured like glacier that's uphill, so I should mention that this is the, the right hand side uh, is the higher ground and then it goes down into the impact basin on the, on the left hand side. So, um, summarizing what we believe to be the, um, the formation of Sputnik clinicia, um, you have a large impact which gives you the, the large impact basin. Um, you then have the cold trapping of uh, nitrogen and carbon monoxide ice, which eventually gets deep enough to cover any internal topography. Um, also, the internal topography will eventually be kind of evening out over time, viscously relaxing over time. Um, and then as the deposit of nitrogen ice builds, it can de destabilize some of the extra fragmented rim material which then breaks off and kind of floats starts has started to kind of float into this nitrogen ice mass glacier okay so um, some of the work that I've been doing trying to study um, Sputnik clinicia is working out what was the impact angle um, how fast was the, the impactor that caused it? How large was the impactor that caused it? And also looking at how an impact of that size can affect the wider crust um, and how much heating is delivered to the planet, dwarf planet, um, <laughs> uh, because of that impact. So over here, you just have material type. Apologies, it's not in useful color. We've got a silicate interior an ocean and an ice crust. Um, and then the other thing, this is our damage. So I started off with a undamaged target. Um, the first, the, you'll see that this, the water layer will immediately turn green as soon as I progress it. And that's because the water layer is by definition 100% damaged, strengthless. Um, and then the temperature over here is, is one of the things that I've been, uh, been looking at. Oops, pointless. <laughs> there we go. So I find it very interesting how much of the surface is fractured, um, giving you potential conduits for, between the surface and the ocean. Uh, you also get a, uh, a mass damage result at the antipode. Uh, this, for now, is a 2D simulation. Um, and so this antipodal damage um, could be an axis um, artifact. So my next, my next move with this project is to take it up to 3D. And I imagine that that's probably still going to be there in my 3D simulations but I will have been able to say that's not an axis artifact. So having a, a look at the other sections of the heart now, into the eastern side of Tombar Reggio, <coughs> uh, we have Tartus dorsa. Um, some people have called this snake skin terrain or dragon skin terrain, and it is composed of large, very high swells of um, methane ice, which have then formed these, what we think are gigantic penitentes. Um, and so the, I'll take you straight on to some 
earth images of penitentes. They are horrible, you don't want to land a spacecraft on this, blades of ice. Um, and on Pluto, they, they're orders of magnitude larger than we have on Earth. And they are, they're formed, we think, due to the preferential sublimation of the ice, um, due to the, the different sun angle. So they, they form dependent on the general sun angle. Um, so we were just having a look at Tartus Dorsa here, and this particular viewing um, allows you to see the swells and the deep valleys that the smaller penitentes formed on. And then if we're going north of this, um, we see a large spidery fracture system. Now we've seen other sorts of fracture systems like this across the solar system. Here's an example from Venus. Here's an example from Mercury with a probably unrelated impact crater superimposed on top of that. Um, and we think this form of fracture system uh, occurs at a presence of upwelling. Um, and so this was an, an interesting feature because it points towards um, relatively recent, it doesn't have very many impact craters interfering with the fractures, so we think that Obviously, this fracture system post-dates any of the impact craters in the area. So this was one of our indications that Pluto is a lot more currently active than we were expecting. Um, so I, I said that I'd get back to you about the, um, the fracturing in the northern hemisphere. Um, we see several types of tecton tectonics on Pluto. Um, and so they're, they're kind of separated into three different regimes. The, oh dear. <laughs> Hopefully that'll go away. I can't see the screen, so just a moment. Stop share. Yeah, you can just kill it. Oh, sorry. That's okay, don't worry about it, it's already dead. <laughs> there you go. Oh, oh, and it went back, lovely. <coughs> so. The, um, the, the north-south fracture sets and the, uh, the large ancient fracture systems that we see, um, we think are part of ancient crustal expansion um, as the ocean part froze. So of course, water solidifies, increases in volume, so you get that ripping apart of the, um, of the crust. I specify part freeze. We don't think that Pluto has completely solidified its ocean because we have a few other um, indicators that it was still there when Sputnik Planitia, when Sputnik uh, impact occurred. Um, so at the bottom here is a modeled um, stress and fracture prediction based on when you have the Sputnik impact basin form and then the crustal loading um, associated with the upwelling of the mantle and the weight of the um, nitrogen ice, it will have affected where that body, where that mass moved to on a body that has a subsurface ocean. So you have that disconnect between the, the mantle and the, the crust, which allows the crust to reorientate. And so the modeling done by Kinatel um, the, they've looked back at the, the mapped actual fractures that we see and they, they've, they said it's in, in good agreement with their model. Um, so a lot of the fracturing we see um, is indicative that the crust of Pluto shifted to accommodate um, Sputnik Planitia. Um, we then later, most recently, see smaller scale fractures um, which is part of the interesting ongoing activity that we think is occurring on Pluto. Um, another uh, active or potentially active part of Pluto um, is right down at the base of uh, Sputnik Planum, and that is um, these volcanic constructs. Um, so Wright Mons and Picard Mons, uh, they were originally named because we, we thought that they were clear 
volcanic vents and a volcanic deposit. But as we've got more and more data back and um, constructed digital terrain models, we saw that in fact what could have been a, a deep vent was actually the same level as the rest of the surrounding terrain. So it's now been suggested that this entire region is a slowly moving, oh, sorry, originally slowly moving um, cryovolcanic terrain, which just didn't fill in this part and these parts, and that they are not, they're not the vents, but the entire region must have had some upwelling, potentially from multiple vents, and that it kind of converged on different sites. It's difficult. It depends what image you're looking at as to whether you believe that or not. Um, I do believe it, <laughs> um, based on the topography. Um, so moving on to um, the binary, uh, the binary partner for Pluto, uh, Charon. Sh uh, there are many different ways of pronouncing it. Um, Karen, Sharon, Charon. Um, I tend to swap between them depending on the sentence, so apologies for the inconsistency. Um, we have a lot, a lot more well-preserved craters. I wouldn't say we have a lot of craters. I was expecting a lot more impact craters on what I was going to... I was expecting an, uh, an old, inactive body. Um, but we don't see that, that many craters. Um, so it might be suggestive that they're just aren't that many impacts occurring in this region of the solar system. Um, they're occurring at a velocity that is too slow to um, always give us an impact structure or the, the porosity in certain regions of Charon is, you know, doesn't uh, record that impact crater very well. But what we do note on Charon compared to Pluto is a lot more um, well-preserved craters because we don't have so much volatile cycling um, and activity on Charon, and so they're not being broken down as much as Pluto. Um, so other things that we do see, um, moated mountains. So it's a you can see them on the limb here because of the, the sun angle allows you to see the topography a little bit better. And so this is what we think um, right mons on Pluto might be similar to, is you have this large divot here, you have a, a divot with a kind of central mountain there, and it's been suggested that, th again, this whole region did experience kind of a cryovolcanic event, which was viscous enough so that it didn't, it didn't flow up to this uh, existing mountain and cover its base, it kind of stalled and created these, what we're calling, m moated mountains. Um, we also see uh, that the two main things that most people see when they look at Charon are the, its uh, brown cap and this large canyon system. Uh, so you'll remember from Pluto that when we see this kind of browny red, reddy tinge in the enhanced color image, um, that's the deposition of uh, tholins. Now, Charon is not large enough to hold its own atmosphere, which is one of the reasons we don't see the big volatile cycling like we do on Pluto, is we don't have that atmosphere condensing and um, uh, sublimating. And so we think that the way that you're getting this is actually um, escape from Pluto's atmosphere, traveling across and being captured by the cold the cold pole of Charon and um, producing a, a, a deposit of tholins in that area. The, the canyon system is gigantic it, um, and what we think that is from is the, again, like Pluto, but more completely, the global expansion after its ocean froze. So we think that Charon has probably, um, its ocean has frozen out and it caused the expansion in the crustal ice and basically ripped open its crust. So the Pluto and Charon system have uh, 
a few other moons. Um, these are to scale in terms of their size, but not to scale in terms of their distance. Um, all of them have on-topic names, Styx, Nyx, Hydra, and Kerberos. Um, some of them were, um, we, we were really looking ahead of us as we were approaching um, Pluto to make sure that we had seen everything that we needed to see. There was a daily hazard update on the latest images because the New Horizons probe flew between the orbits of Charon and Pluto. So there was a worry that if they hadn't accreted all of the, um, the, the dust in their system, or if we, if we had a tiny moonlit that we hadn't seen, that we might fly into something on our way through the, um, through the Pluto system. So because we're about to start talking about um, other Kuiper Belt bodies, I'd like to point out the, the bilobate nature of Hydra, Kerberos and even Styx. So we're going to talk about the, the next target for New Horizons. We went through the Pluto system and then four years later we had identified, changed course slightly and gone to meet um, MU69 um, uh, 2014. Um, so it was discovered before we had the Pluto encounter, but we hadn't made up our minds as to which Kuiper Belt body we were going to go to until afterwards. Um, and I wanted to show you this image first, because um, this is how tiny Arakos is compared to Pluto. And it's much further from the sun, so it's darker, it's tinier. Um, We'd only discovered it in 2014, and we had our encounter with it in 2019. So we weren't exactly sure if it was going to be in the part of space that we were heading to, because we thought um, we, we'd only had five years to track its orbit. Um, so there was an awful lot of uncertainties about it. Um, so I'm extremely impressed with the mission operations team that managed to get us this image. Um, uh, but I won't have very much to say about its geology because this is as good as it gets. It doesn't have um, the good lighting conditions that we had for Pluto. The, the lighting angle is pretty much right behind us as we imaged. So most of the things you see here are albedo features, not topography. And that's very disappointing for an impact cratering person because I, I don't know whether these are, are impacts or it's a sublimation deposit or a, um, uh, a collection of ice in, a, um, in a, an otherwise non-impact related hole. Um, and also the, um, some, of the, some of the depressions that we were more confident, these are depressions. And all of the impact cratering people were like, great, look, see, craters. When they occur in groups um, along, uh, along certain areas on Arakos, we think instead that they're actually collapse pits. And so the reason I say if they occur in certain parts of Arakos, it's that if you have a look at this larger lobe here, you can make out several accretional units. So we think this formed right at the beginning of the solar system and the, the blocks that accreted to form it didn't, they didn't merge well enough to hide themselves as one cohesive body. And so we see about, I think we see about seven, five or seven accretional units, the most obvious one being here, and the a lot of the pit chains that we see on the surface occur at the, the edges of what we think are the accretional units. So they might be some sort of uh, volatile venting or purely a collapse pit. We do see one definite impact crater and that is Sky. It's surprisingly large considering how small this smaller lobe of Arakos is. Um, 
and it has been suggested that if what we're seeing here aren't impact craters, there needs to be a reason for how, um, how few impact craters there are in this. Because what we think we're seeing is a building block of the solar system, ancient and unaffected by coming closer to the sun. So it should be covered in craters. It should be ancient. Um, so there's a few, um, few suggestions why we don't see this. For a start, it's such a tiny body, tiny gravity, and the predicted impact speed that far out in the solar system is only about 300 meters per second. So will you get a crater in the first place, or will they, um, will it, will it be, uh, will it hide itself? Because if it's particularly porous, um, will the, will the impactor slowly kind of enter and you'll get a splotch, like you might get an albedo feature, but you might not necessarily get your stereotypical bowl shaped, there's an impact crater. Um, and, and like I said, the, the, the lighting angle makes things difficult. Oh, uh, here's an example of what some of these uh, albedo features might be. Um, it might be sublimation related. So this is an image of some, uh, the southern polar cap of Mars. You get what we call it like a Swiss cheese terrain as you get the, the sublimation of the seasonal ices. Um, preferentially forming this very like bulbous edges. Um, another thing to note, um, which is the, the collar. Um, I'm sure that I could have moved away from the word collar at this point, the neck, but when we first saw it, it was likened to a dirty snowman and you basically, like he's wearing a, a little white collar. Um, there's a couple of reasons why this might be here. It might be the downward movement of anything exposed at the surface will be fresher, not as red, because it's not as space, we space weathered yet. And the, um, the kind of center of mass of this body is about here. So everything moves downhill and deposits around its neck. Uh, another option is the fact that that neck doesn't get any direct sunlight. The orientation and the spin of Arakoth, um, we've been able to image it based on like reflect, reflected light, but it doesn't get any direct sunlight. So this might again be a cold trap of some sort of ice. Um, and the, the big result from this um, was that it was a contact binary. Um, just showing you that you, these two parts obviously came together, the meeting of two Kuiper belt objects in an impact that did not destroy, but created. And so there's a couple of simulations here for different impact conditions. Uh, this first is a grazing impact, so, and then it keeps on going. It's too fast, the angle isn't right. And then if we slow down and we have a different angle, you can get the, the merging together of two Kuiper belt bodies and maintain this kind of snowman shape. So you'll see in this simulation that it's, it's got a thicker neck than uh, we do see at... Um, Arakoth. And so the, the modelers in question ran so many of these to see if they could get it to stick. Um, and I know that they experienced an awful lot of frustration having things that were too glancing. They're like, is it going to stick? Is it going to? And it just kept going. So, but their, their best fit case was a three meter per second impact. I, I've walked into lampposts faster than that. So this was really, really slow and with a, an impact angle of 80 degrees. So it glancing, but not enough to keep going. Um, those uh, those uh, models were assuming spherical Kuiper belt objects, um, but we think 
that this is the, the true shape of uh, Arakos is more pancake-ish than circular. It's difficult to tell exactly because we flew past this so quickly and we didn't have much time to image this tiny area. And so these little movies show us the... You can hopefully see here, it's like, oh yes, it's not, it's not a circle. And especially in the, the black and white here, you can see the accretional mounds a little bit better, especially this one. Okay, here is a, another model to visualize how we think it formed originally, right at the beginning of the solar system. Uh, you have the um, gravitational collapse of the, this section of the protoplanetary disk, and so you have the accretion process start up, um, and the clumping together of everything. And then we think originally they began as a binary pair um, and with a, a few moonlets and that the moon moonlets were left taking with them some of the um, angular momentum of the system, slowing it down and allowing a, um, a relatively modest impact speed. So... Um, we haven't seen very many, we haven't imaged very many Kuiper Belt objects. Um, we've just covered Pluto, Charon, and Arakos, and then the, the moons of Pluto and Charon. Um, and we think Triton, a moon of Neptune, is a captured Kuiper Belt object. And so the point that I wanted to make on this slide is if this is all we've seen, there's a surprising amount of activity. Like we've got geysers, on Triton, we've got this bubbling nitrogenized glacier and cryovolcanic activity on Pluto, um, clear um, subsurface ocean uh, ex related expansion. Um, so if we went to other Kuiper Belt objects, we're sure to find something different. It would not be a boring, oh, look, it's Pluto again. Like, it's, I, I have good faith that there's a lot of very interesting things out there. And the second point I wanted to make is out of all of these, apart from the, the, the larger ones have made themselves circular under their own gravity, but um, Styx, Kerberos, Hydra, and Arakos, they've all got that bilobate shape. And so this is a, um, this makes us think that there's an awful lot of bilobate building blocks to the solar system out there because we, we see that in comets. Um, about 70% of comets are bilobate. Here are the examples. Um, but it's very difficult to look at a comet which comes into the sun and gets, um, gets uh, degraded by the, the solar wind and it's outgassing. We don't know whether they started looking like that or whether there was preferential um, destruction of the comet surface. But when comparing it to a cold classical Kuiper Belt object that has not been um, degraded by coming closer to the sun, um, what we're suggesting is that this is what comets started out looking like. Um, oh, and I've got the the um, the orbit. Apologies, the Ultima Thule was a nickname for Arakos before its official naming. Um, and this has escaped my edits. And so you can see it, its orbit has not taken it close enough to the sun. So um, it was mostly an excuse for a fun Pluto tour, but with a little bit of um, more focus on the impact, the creational side of impacts. Uh, the destructive side will be tomorrow. Um, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to, to email me. And thank you for having me.